Next, please welcome Mr. Matt Valentine, Enterprise Solution Director of Microsoft Hong Kong to share with us Windows Azure and the cloud computing opportunity for developers. Okay, so I haven't tested my network connection, so I hope that it all works very swimmingly when I get to my uh, demos later. Uh, my name is Matt Valentine. I'm the uh, Enterprise Strategy Director for Microsoft Hong Kong, a uh, Solution Director, actually. Um, my job is to work with our top customers here uh, and help them innovate with software, help them think about technology, how to use that technology, and help them grow their businesses. Um, very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, it's um, uh, always a privilege to be at these events. Uh, today we're talking about three of the most important topics in computer science as far as I'm concerned. Cloud, big data, and application development. Uh, these are things that get me up in the morning that I'm very passionate about. So we'll be talking about all three of these. Any one of these is probably a, works, uh, a, week's, a week's worth uh, of, of, uh, of a conference. So we'll have to sort of distill it down to the, to the top line points. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. The transformation of ICT is, is, is really around these three points we just talked about. Cloud computing, computing at massive scale with share, shared resources, big data, uh, the massive amounts of data and being able to glean insights, and application development. Uh, applications are how most users experience IT. And it's those applications which really make the difference. about how we got to this point. I'll talk about Windows Azure a little bit later uh, and, and why we built Windows Azure. But I want to talk about some of the uh, macroeconomic and macro technical um, uh, issues in the marketplace today uh, to really build a foundation of, of what Azure is and, and why it's here. Processing power, for the last about 40 years, processing power has been doubling every 18 months. So you've probably heard of Moore's Law. Uh, until about three years ago, we sort of reached the level, uh, the um, uh, the limits of, of physics uh, and the ability to put uh, semiconductors on chips has reached its theoretical limits. Uh, bandwidth, bandwidth is doubling uh, every, um, um, every about two years. Uh, in Hong Kong here, we enjoy very, very high bandwidth. Uh, the 4G bandwidth that we have on our phones is faster than most homes in the U.S. So we can download movies and videos much faster uh, while we're on the MTR or waiting for a bus. Uh, than our colleagues around the world. And then storage capacity. Storage uh, is, 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 is essentially free. Uh, as you can see here, this is a, uh, a IBM 3380 DASD. Uh, it costs about $100,000 in 1980 to store one gigabyte of data. Now, now our flash memory cards you know, probably don't hold less than eight. I go to Shum Shui Po, the smallest uh, drive I can buy uh, is about five terabytes. And incidentally, I was just reading that the first terabyte drive was only in 2007, only six years ago. So as a result, computing costs are going through the floor. Computing costs, for all intents and purposes, are free. We're not really paying for computing anymore. <coughs> We're paying for, and this sort of goes back to Chris's point, labor. Hard work, sweat, and tears, that's what we're paying for. As a result, in order to drive further cost efficiencies, we need to drive down labor costs. So rather than having one administrator looking after five servers, they need to look after 50 or 50,000. Being able to look at massive amounts of servers, be able to manage them. Giving people self-service capabilities so that people can provision their own uh, virtual machines, their own websites. Take out that middle layer of IT. <coughs> Cloud computing is also about openness. Uh, it's about uh, familiar protocols, tools, frameworks. Uh, as developers, we want to be able to grab something off of a source forge or, or um, uh, GitHub and then be able to pull that down uh, and, and build something very, very quickly. And then, of course, scalable, elastic, and flexible. Pay as you go and only for what you use. Yeah, using the uh, octopus card model, if you will. So, doesn't make sense for us to all have a card. I just want to take a bus ride. I use my octopus card. For our application developers today, the hot topics in application development are developing for devices and cloud services. At the speaker's dinner last night, uh, the conversation pretty much focused around 
those two topics. How do I build apps for uh, all the different devices that are available or are out there in the market today? And then how do I build scalable cloud services that those apps can connect to? Developers today choose open standards, open frameworks, open platforms, uh, Linux, Ruby on Rails, PHP, uh, just you know, cheap, free, and easy, be able to, to wire them together and, and be able to make it happen. However, there's one constant life, time, we still need to deliver faster uh, and, and better than we ever did before. So big data, uh, we talked a little bit about big data yesterday. Um, we've essentially, like I said, reached a point where storage is free. It costs more in labor costs to throw something away for me to go through the computer and figure out which files I don't want anymore than just to keep it on the off chance that I might need it someday. As a result, we have more data, more pictures, more video, more tweets, more Facebook um, likes, more data than we've ever had before. We're approaching a state where the sample set n equals all, which is quite phenomenal when you think about uh, the potential. But you have to make sense out of the data. It's not enough just to store that data. You need to be able to look at that data, analyze the data, find trends, find insights, find opportunities, and drive organizations forward. And you need to be able to help people take that analysis, put it in their hands, put it in their mobile devices, and help them make decisions. Help them drive business, drive their organizations forward. Uh, this is a uh, picture of the large, uh, the CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, they have 300 gigabytes per second and 27 terabytes coming in a day. The only way they can really understand and make sense of that level of, uh, of data is through advanced visualization techniques. So big data, most of the um, uh, reporters and pundits and, and analysts pretty much define big data in three things. Massive data volume. It's, it's just cheap enough to keep everything. Uh, so it's, uh, that's a, sort of an internet fact that Walmart uh, generates 2.5 petabytes every hour from all of their stores. Uh, an airplane engine generates about 500 uh, megabytes for uh, every 30 minutes that it's in the air. Um, it, they're just massive amounts of data. One of my customers, I'm uh, looking at smart meters and sensors and the Internet of Things, all generating all of this, this data. So you have massive volumes, which presents the challenge of storing it. The other char characteristic of big data is around new data sources. Uh, in the old days, we sort of normalized the data, we stripped out all of the uh, nonsense, we, we put it in a, uh, uh, in a relational database. Uh, as they say, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, we need to be able to take that uh, XML or those tweets or that unstructured data, uh, take those pictures or the video or the call logs from our CRM center, uh, and be able to look into it, pull that together, uh, and, um, and drive insights. Uh, and incidentally, that doesn't happen by magic. That happens by application development. And then real-time and fast-moving data. Uh, the, the data is coming in fast and furious, and as a business person or someone running an organization, uh, you want to make good decisions, and you need to be able to uh, process that real-time and fast-moving data. It's been said, if you had a picture of the highway from one minute ago, would you still try to run across it? Probably not. So I want to take a step back from technology just for a second. I spent a lot of my time talking to uh, uh, CTOs and CIOs of, of businesses here in Hong Kong. A lot of financial services organizations, as you well know, and they go, okay, that's great. You know, we kind of get big data from a, a um, uh, technology perspective, but what can it do for my business? Organizations that leverage the power of analytics in their decision making and strategic planning process outperform their competitors by up to three times. By 2015, businesses that build a modern information management system will outperform their peers financially by 20%. 75% of business leaders say more predictive analytics would drive better decisions, and almost one third of respondents expect the impact to be transformational. And top performing companies are three times more likely than lower performers to be sophisticated users of analytics. There was a, on Forbes, there was a uh, cover story about big data. When Forbes is talking about big, big data, there's money here. So there's an opportunity for us all as, as data specialists, data scientists, application developers, computer engineers, to really help organizations and help businesses take advantage of this massive influx of data. Let me give you some examples. 
Uh, this is the uh, Intercontinental uh, Hotel. Um, about 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to help design and, and build their, their first e-commerce site. Um, they, until they applied big data techniques, uh, would take their customer information uh, and they could pretty much build about 15 segments to target messages to. So, you know, hello business traveler, hello vacation traveler, about 15 messages. They were able to run some big data analytics on it and really find many more insights, saying, hey, you were here last year for Chinese New Year, or I see that you like rugby, be able to target the uh, offers and advertisements and promotions much more effectively. Uh, they were able to, as a result of this, uh, put out about 1,500 targeted messages and increase their campaign effectiveness by 35%. That's just one example. Another example, uh, UPS, you know, logistics and shipping. Um, probably no surprise, they have sensors in their trucks. Everything from going forward, going fast, speed, GPS, uh, whether the speed seatbelt's been fastened, uh, traffic. Uh, being able to look at all of that data and be able to uh, identify opportunities to choose the right route uh, or, or help um, uh, UPS people be more, the delivery people be more effective. Uh, they were able to save about 46,000 vehicles. Uh, they managed to save $8.5 million on fuel costs by being able to use this data to optimize uh, their delivery operations. What's also interesting, potentially more interesting, they make this data available to third parties. Uh, this is, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. The smartest people in the world probably work for someone else. Uh, so they take this data and they give it out to the market uh, and allow them to use that to innovate and find new ideas. So There's a classic Netflix example, who can build a better recommendation engine and making that AAA contest. But what uh, UPS does is make this information available, and there's a number of startups who are using this data to find new insights. One of them is called Cabbage with a K. And then with your approval, uh, you can share your shipping information from UPS with the finance, finance uh, up at the uh, capital financing organization, and they can say, yeah, he's got pretty good uh, inventory turnover. I'm going to give that guy a little bit of money. It's an interesting way to use uh, the, uh, the shipping information. Hiring managers study how candidates answer questions to see if they'd be a good match. Uh, people are your most important asset. We, we, we heard about that from Britt. Um, being able to hire the right people and have them on your team is what makes the difference between success and failure. So a number of organizations have uh, uh, online quizzes, uh, online um, tests that you take. Uh, and they, you know, they study your, your responses and, and they look at millions of different data points to really find out who's a fit for the organization. But not only just how you answer, the, not, not only what you answer the questions, but how you answer. And doing some interesting things like maybe putting a calculus question uh, into a job for an a administrative assistant. See what they do with that kind of information. Do they go off and copy Wikipedia? Do they go figure it out? Do they go learn calculus? Uh, or for a developer, asking them business questions. Being able to make sure that you can take all of this data around this experience and make sure that you're hiring the right people. There are technology companies uh, in the US that are using this stuff to hire the right people. And of course, product development, uh, especially for something like a car, is really quite expensive. Either a, a proof of concept or a pilot uh, can really uh, be very time and, and um, cost consuming. So being able to use news groups and, and, um, uh, and um, uh, discussion forums and Facebook and say, hey, you know, what do you think if we had an orange version of the Ford Fiesta? What do you guys think of that? Uh, we hate it, we hate it, we hate it. And so well, what do you think if we have um, some sort of audio thing, and then being able to get feedback. And being able to correlate all of that and be able to make product decisions at a much cheaper uh, price point than the traditional uh, focus group method. So ultimately, one of the mistakes that you know, we often get about when we talk about big data is about, you know, it's about the technology. Volume, variability, velocity, uh, storage, cloud. Big data is fundamentally about helping human beings make better decisions. And that is the value proposition to any business person, helping them make better decisions. You know, obviously, the, uh, the, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, they've been processing data and, and trying to um, uh, make better decisions about how to make money for, for many, many years. Another example is, is NASA. They have a huge flow of information to help with the uh, Apollo and Space Shuttle programs, uh, weather, telemetry, 
bio, uh, all this different information to help them make decisions about the course of the mission. This is the AT&T Network uh, Operations Center uh, in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Uh, being able to look at all the, the networking hardware, uh, the, uh, the computing hardware, uh, all of the pipes, uh, being able to determine what the, uh, the, the level of, of delivery looks like. Uh, and then, of course, the biggest decision maker of all, Captain Kirk. But he never, he never follows the information, does he? He always just does what his gut tells him. But fundamentally, it's about people and getting them the information they need to be able to make decisions. All right, let's switch gears. That's a little bit of the context I'm coming from. I'm going to talk a little bit about Windows Azure uh, and Microsoft's cloud platform. Um, how many people know Windows Azure or are using it or experimented with it? Okay, yes, all right. Um, just a, just a quick level set to kind of make sure we're on the same page. Windows Azure is Microsoft's cloud platform. Uh, it's uh, about two years old. Uh, it runs in data centers all around the world. So when you deploy your apps, you can choose from them in New York, Hong Kong, um, Japan, or, or um, and, and, you know, wherever is closest to your customers. Physical facilities, um, we have some of the most state-of-the-art data centers in the world. We talked a little bit about this uh, on the panel discussion some of the uh, issues around uh, who owns the data, uh, around risk. I'm not going to go into any of those topics today. I think we covered them yesterday. But uh, if th those are always the first questions that come up. Security, or who's going to be watching my data, or what happens when uh, uh, the investigators come around. Obviously, for this model, the, the computing operating model, the cloud computing operating model to work, we have to have answers for all of those. So I would point you to, to, this, to this website. I want to focus more on the development uh, and the opportunity uh, here today. For developers, uh, the cloud provides a um, flexibility, choice, and openness, uh, and, and this infrastructure as a service, so I can worry about my apps, not the plumbing. And then for big data, just massive amounts of storage, uh, and then analysis, and then distribution. So Windows Azure um, it is, is, is flexible in terms that it supports both infrastructure as a service uh, and platform as a service as well as software as a service. Uh, infrastructure as a service in that uh, and we will host virtual machines for you. Uh, platform as a service is you can build your apps with, with uh, open source tools or open frameworks, um, different languages, uh, and, and we will run them for you. Uh, and then you can also marry those environments. And then also, if you are an organization that you want to build a cloud service, uh, you can provide that cloud service in a software as a service model. It's open, and I'll talk a lot more about that. I know that's a topic that's dear to the uh, hearts of many developers. Uh, and then solid. Uh, this thing needs to be, uh, to, to, to be rock solid in terms of security, reliability, availability, et cetera. So we do offer a 99.95% financially backed monthly SLA. We don't meet this number, we give you some money back. You pay only for what you use. You put up your VM, you say, hey, I need a VM with uh, 160 gigabytes. That's what you pay. You just pay for usage of that VM. Uh, you don't have to buy hardware. You don't have to buy software. You don't have to install it, manage it, put patches on it, um, fix it when it goes down, worry about kicking the plug out. Uh, all of that stuff goes away because it's, you know, it's somewhere behind some locked wall in some data center somewhere. So Microsoft uh, recently, uh, in, earlier in June, uh, went um, with GA, General Availability for Virtual Machines, uh, on, on Windows Azure. Of course, support Windows Server uh, as well as Linux. Uh, that may be a surprise, but uh, you know, we're, we're happy to host uh, any VM from anyone. We actually announced earlier this week that we'll run uh, Oracle uh, databases and Oracle um, uh, uh, Linux as well. Flexible workload support from data analytics to web pages to virtual machines to um, uh, service buses to just about anything you can imagine, we, we, we can handle it all. And then virtual private networking. What's interesting about this is all of the capacity that's available in our data centers looks like it's in your data center. So if all of our IP addresses become yours when, when we're on the same VPN. So we'd be willing to set that up, uh, put holes uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the firewalls where it makes sense. It just looks like extra capacity on demand. So as your startup grows, uh, you can move your VMs to Azure, pick up all your servers and, and PCs, go to another building, uh, and then download them back um, from, from the new location. All right, so uh, let me flip over to my uh, demo real quick.
Okay, so this is the Windows Azure uh, portal. I'm logged in with my uh, uh, Windows Live credentials. Uh, you can see all the services I have. Let me just go to virtual machine right here. Uh, I have a virtual machine running here. Uh, let me go ahead and connect to it. Yeah, this is what happens when you don't connect, when you don't test the uh, internet connection. Yeah, all right, we're gonna skip that. So, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to create a new virtual machine. I can do a quick create, and I have an image here. Uh, all of these different images already pre-built. Uh, and these are just VHD files residing up in the uh, up in the cloud somewhere. Uh, you'll notice some interesting things like Ubuntu, SUSE, Open Linux. Um, yeah, it's all there. And then you can choose the size uh, of the virtual machine. Uh, with eight cores, 56 gigabytes of memory. Uh, once that uh, machine is, is allocated, uh, it's yours. It's up there running in the uh, in the cloud. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of the. Endpoints. You can monitor its usage, uh, and you pretty much you pretty much pay by the usage uh, of that virtual machine. So one of the cool things about virtual machine portability is that you know, your data center or your set of servers underneath your uh, underneath your desk or in your dorm room or uh, in your office. You can take your virtual machines uh, and move them back seamlessly between uh, Windows Azure and your data center. There's no process that you have to run that converts them, uh, just to move those back and forth. In addition, we have a number of service providers and partners uh, who will run those machines as well. So this gives you a lot of flexibility and choice and a hybrid cloud approach to being able to uh, build your infrastructure. Really making it so there's no lock-in. The VM also is persisted across three drives. So that, that VHD is, is stored. Three different machines, three different drives. One of those drives goes out, says okay, we still got two other, uh, we're gonna rebuild a, a third. And then in addition, um, the continuous storage and geo-replication between uh, for us again, Hong Kong and Singapore, so that you actually have six copies uh, of your VHD, um, three here and three there. They're all constantly backing up um, to, to each other. So with the websites, you can build them to ASP.NET, Node.js, or PHP. And you deploy in seconds with FTP, uh, Git, or uh, TFS. Uh, and then you can start for free, and then as you scale up, um, as your traffic goes. So I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on the, uh, uh, on the internet connection here. So here I am in my Visual Studio. I got a simple app here. And I can do the file, new project, uh, cloud, Windows Azure Cloud Service. So you, you, know, you can write here cloud service. Uh, this could be a, a web page. This could be a, a listener for a, a mobile device. This could be a, a message bus. It's, it's basically a, a component residing in the data center. Uh, and then once you um, publish it, I mean, this is fairly straightforward, you publish it, publish it straight to Windows Azure. Uh, I'll give it a shot, see what happens. Publish started, here's my uh, Windows here. So there's my page. So just to prove that there's now smoke and mirrors. You can also run the uh, Windows Azure emulator uh, on your desktop uh, so that you don't actually necessarily have to be connected to Azure. Uh, we also see so you be running and, running and testing and building those apps. You know, so there it is, there's a blue there. 
fairly straightforward to publish. So in essential, in, in essence, we can run your VMs, but we can also run your, your, your websites and web pages. Um, we also support um, rigorous development best practices in terms of building the code, moving it to a uh, staging environment, moving it to a testing environment, and then finally approving it and then moving it to a production environment. So you can have that full pipeline. Uh, in addition, so I showed you uh, Visual Studio, but someone out there thought, well, I use Eclipse. And we have plugins for Eclipse, you can use Eclipse too. Some people go, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I don't like those tools, I like command line. We have that too. Uh, I work with the Mac. Uh, well, I also work with uh, you know, Firefox. So, uh, good, no problem. So uh, it's all open in terms of the, uh, the frameworks uh, and the application. I'm part of Visual Studio after a few years. Uh, I used to be a Visual H for Java guy many, many years ago. But whatever tools make sense to you, being able to build those apps. The other thing I wanted to show you, um, When you look at the Windows Server image, there is an A drive, a floppy drive. And I don't understand, and I look perfectly on the internet, why a server in a cloud somewhere has an A drive. And if there is someone, there's obviously not, if there's someone with floppy drives going around at the A call, and you can see I was searching for floppy there, I was going to show it to you, but, um, but it, it didn't work out. So um, another website thing I want to show you is, um, in addition to let's see, a new website from Gallery, let me know if some of these frameworks look familiar to you. For the .NET crowd, .NET Nuke, uh, CakePHP, Django. Uh, I don't even know what some of these are. I'm sure that you guys are probably much more familiar. But of course, WordPress um, for blogs. Basically, spinning up the service, not in a VM, but spinning up the 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 the, uh, the, the, um, the, the apps. Uh, I won't I won't go through the whole WordPress. Um, WordPress, 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 North Central, US, you yeah, know, we put it there, but let's put it there. Let's try that database. Uh, let's see what the third is. Rules, okay. It, it'll think about it for a while, and then when it comes up, it will um, basically give me a first time instance uh, of WordPress. So the ability to use these frameworks, load other frameworks, uh, if you have your favorite image of, of Linux with your development tools on there, uh, up, uh, and frameworks, load that up into um, uh, load that up into Azure. One of my, um, one of my uh, consultant friends was mentioning to me that there's the opportunity to, you can download these images from um, uh, from, from Azure as well. So you could actually go up there and grab uh, Windows Server uh, 2012 um, uh, R2 or SQL Server uh, 2014 CCP, which is the, uh, which is the beta. So our objective here is, over the years, um, maybe not over the years, but uh, uh, since it's probably the dawn of computing, you know, there's been this, the, there's the infrastructure people and, the, and then there's the devs. So sometimes they talk, but mostly they kind of argue. Uh, really, we want the devs to be focused on, on solving business problems. Again, uh, apps are the way that most people experience uh, IT. So using your creativity, your passion, your insights to build these, these applications. I don't expect you guys, and you probably shouldn't expect yourselves to be experts in failover, redundancy, networking, uh, IP stacks. These are probably all things that you've had to learn because you've had to. Um, the, the objective here is to try to make that as simple as possible so you can focus uh, on building applications. So we have a set of cloud services. You know, we've seen a few. Uh, it's about building infinitely scalable apps and services, uh, support rich multi-tier architectures, and automated application management. If I go to, uh, let's go to the sport 
press start here. Uh, scale. Let's uh, see. I can say okay. I'm going to need what I think is probably going to be three instances of that um, uh, of that word press site. But the popular blog. So this is one of these examples that you just pay for for pay for what you use. Uh, and then um, as you go up, um, and you can select the different aspects. Then you can monitor you know, all these these deep analytics: CPU time, data in, data out, data, data out, uh, etc. Of course, you know we have network load balancing and redundancy built into the platform. So as the different devices, uh, PCs, televisions, phones, um, come in, where those servers goes down. Uh, we create a, a new instance, whether it's a new instance of the uh, virtual machine or a, a new instance of your web app, uh, and, and use the network, um, the, uh, the network load balance. There are a lot of things uh, in Azure. Uh, we don't have time for them today. Uh, there's big data. Uh, there's, there's database. I'll talk a little bit about those because they are important. Storage, just sort of flat file storage. Um, uh, traffic management, caching uh, with, with the MCache, uh, MCache. Uh, messaging, enterprise service bus or internet service bus, uh, being able to uh, send messages between disparate heterogeneous and homogeneous systems. Identity, being able to mirror with uh, identity providers, uh, as well as Active Directory, which is used by 93% of uh, all enterprises. Media, uh, being able to uh, store and distribute media. We have a number of um, companies that uh, are doing uh, movie streaming, television streaming, uh, moving the content to the edge, edges of the network. Uh, to make it available to, to um, uh, the users, uh, which is part of the content delivery network uh, and the um, uh, networking capabilities. Uh, another application building block is Ganymac. We'll be here this afternoon to go deep into each of these uh, uh, areas. So I would, I would hope you'll stick around for uh, the, the workshops this afternoon. Uh, he will, uh, he's promised me no slides. So I think that probably uh, uh, excites most developers. Uh, it's a Q&A session, and you can go into any one of these topics that you want to go into. But you want to know how the caching works, so we have to give you the uh, uh, down and dirty on that. Of course, we support multiple languages, like we said. We have uh, developer centers with uh, SDKs uh, and development tools for .NET, Java, PHP, Node.js, and Python, uh, as well as uh, there's a number of, um, uh, for example, GitHub um, and other areas where you can uh, get and exchange uh, code uh, and tips and tricks. I'll talk a little about database. You know, since we're talking about big data uh, and, and databases, um, uh, it's an important uh, consideration. Uh, in, addition to be, in addition to being able to run a SQL Server uh, or, or Oracle or MySQL database uh, in the cloud, uh, we also have a database as a service. So you can have your phone, you can have your phone uh, does a uh, select star from you know, some IP address in the cloud. Uh, and, and, and you can write to the cloud. You don't need to manage uh, the hardware, the operating system, the patching, the management, uh, the database. It's just table. It's tables in the cloud uh, available for your access. Clustered by, for high availability, as we've seen a little bit, fully managed, and of course you can uh, apply the business intelligence and SQL reporting to that. Um, just give you a quick look at what that looks like. Oh, SQL database here. Create a SQL database. Which will do it in isolated. Um, yeah, so you get it. I mean, so you can spin up a, a new, new database pretty quickly. Now, one of the um, one of the uh, uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday with, uh, with the little LinkedIn Hadoop. It's really sort of become and emerged as a, a de facto standard for um, big data and big data analytics. There is sort of this impression with the non-initiated that Hadoop is a turnkey thing. Uh, in fact, it's really a, uh, it's, it's an open source framework from Apache where developers have to go in uh, and, and, and build, the, um, uh, build, the, build the data, uh, build the data mining and, and um, uh, the data analysis app. So there's a lot of opportunity for data scientists and data specialists and, and data developers. Um, so as a framework, it's available uh, from Apache, it's open source framework. Um, it's optimized for unstructured data. So documents, Facebook, tweets, 
etc. Um, that's oriented and ignored on, on petabytes of data. So it works a little bit like a web search where you take the data, you distribute it across thousands of servers, I take my query, I break it up, I send it across those thousands of, of, of servers, I get the answer, I bring it back, I recompose it, there's my answer. As opposed to the traditional database model where I have to put all the data into a data warehouse and have one single way to look at it. Uh, given the volume and the, and, the, and the variety of data, it's actually become um, uh, quite difficult. So what we do is we offer um, a Hadoop uh, as, as, a, uh, as a service uh, on Windows Azure. Um, what we've done is we've engineered it for Windows and added things like security, virtualization, systems management, all of those things you'd have to layer on yourself uh, and made that available just as a service uh, in Windows. So we have a full range of, of choices um, for managing data. Of course, we can run SQL Server uh, on the bare metal uh, in, in, on a server in your office. Uh, we can run it um, in a private cloud, virtualized. And as you've seen, we can run it, in, run it uh, in a virtual machine uh, in a public cloud. And you have the flexibility to move the, uh, uh, the databases around. Classic use cases. A little bit like the example Brit used, I have, a, uh, I have a database or an app. I didn't really know that it was going to be so popular. Uh, I can now move it to a, 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 um, uh, a, a deployment mode that makes more sense for the, the amount of volume that it's going to have. Now, in Windows Azure, uh, we also have the, uh, the relational database as a service that I alluded to. Uh, we also run HD Insight, uh, which is our version of uh, or our implementation of, of Hadoop make that available as a service. So what that means is that you can uh, take all of your data, put it up in the cloud, run some jobs, get some insights, uh, pay for what you need, and go back to the business and say, hey, here, here's what we found out. Then there's another um, um, service, the Windows Azure Marketplace. Uh, it's uh, the uh, online data marketplace service. This is where you as developers can take these data feeds, uh, analyze them, and maybe find some insights that could be valuable. Or maybe you have a bunch of data. Maybe you are the world's leading expert on golden egg-shaped auditoriums. And you put that information uh, in, uh, in, in Windows Azure, and you're able to sell that. And those are all available from a variety of different applications and services. There's two examples here. Our OCR, speech. The World Bank, uh, the United Nations. There's a bunch of free uh, data sources. Let's see, uh, the 87 here, the 99 k uh, So lots of opportunities to take these data and really mash them up and really try to find new uh, insights that really drive better decision making. So uh, I'm running a little long here, but uh, let me sort of visual up with, finish up with the data visualization. We talked about storage. We talked about analysis of the data uh, and, and data visualization. I'm not going to spend too much time with this, but um, this is a, uh, a table uh, that I pulled out from one of those public databases of public record. Uh, the data has actually been uh, anonymized, uh, and it's, and it's, and it's a bit um, imaginary uh, for, to protect the, uh, the innocent. Um, but here's a bunch of addresses. The, the key fields here are uh, longitude uh, and latitude. So just using Excel, pulling this information down from the cloud, um, now there's a new capability called GeoFlow. And so I can take this data and I can say, okay. Uh, these are all the different buildings to put the uh, coordinates of latitude and longitude. The height is the square footage. Uh, and then I can layer on um, the, 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 uh, the decade that it was built uh, with the different colors. Uh, and then the next, um, then I can also add uh, time to it. So let me just put a tour for you. So this is just done in Excel. Uh, this is just taking a look at the, uh, the, these different buildings here in Hong Kong. Uh, and so this would be very powerful if you were going to uh, your manager. Uh, we're starting with 1964. We're showing the power utilization uh, across Hong Kong over the last 30 years. Clearly. Uh, The buildings with the biggest square feet are using the most power. So, like I said, this, this, this service has been available for about two years. We just had a new 
uh, set of releases earlier in June. Uh, we have a number of very, very interesting examples. When you have your TV uh, from certain vendors and you plug that TV into the uh, uh, internet, uh, that ethernet goes off and, and, and that IP goes off and connects to um, uh, a Windows Azure service. Uh, there's movie companies. Uh, another one are automobiles uh, where they are sending telemetry data or GPS data to uh, an IP address uh, up in the cloud. So lots of examples. Uh, if you want to talk some more about uh, what people are doing, uh, I'll be around. So feel free to uh, visit windowsazure.com uh, or uh, email me directly at uh, mattvalentine at microsoft.com. Thank you very much for your time. I apologize for waiting for you. Thank you, Matt, for your sharing your presentation.